So good afternoon. Um, my name's Dave McAllister, and um, bear with me. It's right now. It's about seven o'clock a.m. my normal time. Uh, so I will try my best to stay awake and answer all the questions without demanding a cup of coffee uh, during this talk. Um, I work for a company called Solace, and Solace is in the, the business of moving data from one place to another. Uh, we power a lot of financial communities. We power Singapore Smart City. We're in connected car initiatives. We're in transportation. And what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about uh, sort of the experiment that I did in trying to work from an IoT sensor environment into Cloud Foundry. Um, and in this case, I will admit I'm using Pivotal Cloud Foundry simply because we had such an environment set up. So it actually all started real simply. And I'll try to stand in front of the microphone, but I'm really bad at standing behind podiums here. Um, actually, let me see if I can pull this off. It all started actually really simply. Nobody in my neighborhood has the faintest clue as to what I do for a living. And so I decided to build a fairly simple little structure that said, I'm going to build something IoT that I can show people and then explain from that what I'm doing. And so I wanted to use a message to move the data around here. I wanted to build a simple set of services so I could, could mimic the, the necessity of a microservices architecture at the same time. And I wanted to learn as much new things as I could at the same point. Um, the three um, surprised looking creatures behind me are my three cats. And this is the kind of look that I usually got from my neighbors when I tried to talk about data movement and messaging in the first place. Um, so it was pretty much. And so it was a very simple aspect. I wanted to take a simple little particle sensor. And this is Senje uh, PBT42. And it measures either 10 micron particles or 25 micron particles. And I wanted to be able to build this into something that would report something very simple. And of course, that requires me to have the rest of the parts that were there. And I'll get a little bit more into the part list here. This was based originally off a project called Dustduino. And my thanks to Mineral Munitions and Matt Schroyer, this project itself is open source. So if you go out and search for Dustduino, you'll find the source codes available for this. And this was my starting point. Um, I'm a firm believer, I've been around, I was, I was involved in open source before it was called open source. I was at the meeting when Larry Erickson called it open source, when it got named by his person. But then nonetheless, I like to build on top of things rather than trying to recreate something from the beginning. The Dustduino is very simple. It has to come up in this orientation because there's a little resistor down here at the bottom that heats the air so the air goes up across the sensor field. And that's it. This is all it does, just measures the, the dust particles that are inside of that. So very simple architecture. This sensor connected in to show some display stuff. And what you're actually looking at is, from my, my neck of the woods, is data that came out of just being recorded and then dropped into a um, Excel spreadsheet to graft out for five days in August. And as you can see, the numbers vary. And there's a reason for the numbers varying, and we'll get into that um, as I go into sort of the, the next steps inside of here. But because I wanted to treat this as a message rather than just treating this as an environment, you know, just passing the data, I stuck in the middle this virtual message router uh, construct. The virtual message router, community edition, free for use, have fun, do whatever you want to, you can find it out there. But I did this by passing a message. That meant that I had to look at data protocols. I'm no longer just passing a text string, I'm actually passing a message header, a message body, and going into this environment. Again, pretty straightforward, pretty simple inside of that. But then, naturally, <coughs> I showed this off to a couple of people. And somebody promptly says, hey, I work for this local area park called Edgewood Park. And Edgewood Park is a very unique place. It was actually saved because of a butterfly. It was about to be made into a golf course. It was saved because of a butterfly called the Bay uh, Checker Spot. And the Bay Checker Spot was an endangered species. And one of the last two locations it was found was in Edgewood Park. And so Edgewood Park was saved. But if you notice, there's a major road that runs right through Edgewood Park. And what happens is that we start seeing all sorts of invasive weeds show up because of that road coming through. There's all sorts of stuff that comes from the park. And somebody said, wouldn't it be kind of cool if we could figure out what particles are coming over and what happens when the wind direction changes and all these different things. And they said, oh, Dave, you did it for one. You can just do it for the park. No problem. Turns out that IoT scale matters when you build the architecture. 
very honestly. And I'm not even talking about a huge architecture. I'm gonna talk about, about some of the scale aspects that happen in IoT as it comes up. But even going from one simple little thing to 20, which is our original goal, became more of a challenge. And so what happens is now my sensor is feeding MQTT data, message queuing tracking telemetry data, into the VMR. And I wanted to feed that MQTT data via the, via the Solus VMR into Cloud Foundry. And I wanted to feed in road data coming in, and I wanted to feed in weather data coming in, and then I wanted to put something out so I could show it wherever, be it on my phone, be it on my, my um, computer browser, all those different places. So MQTT data on one side, REST data going in, and REST data coming out. I'm sure that with, you, with most of you all, if you're familiar with Cloud Foundry at all, you know that the access of going into a public cloud and into Cloud Foundry has some challenges if it's not HTTP. Fortunately, there are some solutions around that, um, and um, one of them that I'll, I'll talk about that I did use is inside of here. So this is what it actually looks like, all the different pieces here. And there are actually two solutions here. As we've started rolling this out, um, I'm getting other people to, to help pay for this, um, it works out this way. This thing here is a Juice solar battery. So it charges itself during the day, and it can support the entire needs for the Arduino there or there, using an Arduino Uno um, inside of it. So it's perfectly capable of doing that, and the battery itself, without any charge, will run that environment for about four days. So that's, that becomes very straightforward. It's also waterproof, and it makes a nice protective top for the environment that we're going inside of here. The original thing, used, I think it's this one. Yeah, it's this one here, which is an ethernet wireless environment. So Arduino has an ethernet shield that needed to be connected to it. And the one below it is actually the ethernet wired one, which I happened to have lying around. It was my first test case was to use that one. So now it's the wireless one. Now I'm actually gone to using this Arduino, which has wireless built into it. So the entire environment is this Arduino, this sensor, and this battery, and that's it. And now I'm tapping wirelesses that already exist around the park, but that becomes the, the concept. The goal is to ring the park. And right now I've got probably five or six sensors that are out here. I do not have a dashboard. And as I say, this is a very bad mock-up. As you can tell from my PowerPoint slides, I am a lousy design person. Um, so somebody else is going to have to work on the design for me going forward here. But as you can tell, we do tie things such as wind direction, and we tie a little bit of the traffic activity, and we tie, in particular, the particulate count that goes on. And right now, I'm not dropping it continuously. I am dropping it on, I think, uh, what did I pick up, up here? Today? On basically a daily basis inside of here. But the goal is to be able to tie all these things together into a visual representation. So you can see where the traffic is busy, and you can see what direction the wind is blowing from. The wind has a major impact on how much particulate data these sensors pick up, as well as does the elevation above sea level for that environment. So in the center of this park, there is one very tall hill, and the particulate batter up there is not affected by the wind direction as much as you would expect it to be. And that's because being in California, we spend eight months of the year in a completely dry state, and the dust gets picked up. And so as it goes up the hill, the dust seems to go up that hill, and it's a pretty consistent um, measurement, not always. You'll also can tell, I should, I should have put it on here, but you can also tell that there is one distinct dip. I think it's the last day. No, it's this day. Um, number four here, this distinct dip is because it's a Sunday morning. And so the traffic on the road is not as busy. And so there is definitely a distinct dip that happens inside of that. So why did this all become kind of an interesting thing? Well, you know, as it turns out, IoT is really all about the data. We can talk about the sensors, we can talk about the environments, we can talk about the gateways, but very honestly, IoT is all about the data. It's big data. And we do mean really big data. We're involved in connected car initiatives here, but the average connected car will produce 25 gigabytes of data per day, to, or per hour, to the cloud. And this is after it's already sorted out all those different things and figured out what to do with what it's going to. And this is um, Hitachi report. 
Um, so if you go up and look for a connected card, 25 gigs Hitachi, you'll find it. Um, I should have put a, a pointer inside of here. The other one is actually the Google Connected Autonomous Car, and it produces 750 megabytes per second, which is a completely different model. And by the way, that's not the, the data that the car is producing, that's the data the sensors around the car are producing. And right now, they do record all that. They do put it up there. But in a truly IoT type environment, most of that data would get thrown away at the car level inside of that. But just to give you an impact, 25 gigabytes of hour per hour for is 6,875 gigabytes, or 6.875 terabytes per year for the US marketplace alone, if every connected car. If every connected car, um, oh, sorry, if every connected car in the US was running this for the length of time that they think about running, which is 240 hours a year for here, it's uh, 1,740 exabytes of data. And if you take it worldwide to that, it's 14 zettabytes per year. IoT is a big data problem. And I can tell you just moving from one to 20 was a headache. So scale matters inside of this. So I would show off this demo, but um, this is a, a demo of the FAA uh, ground control network. It's something called SWIM, uh, which is the system-wide information management. Um, it's now being looked at in Eurocontrol. It's being looked at over in Japan, in Australia, in New Zealand, because it turns out that um, being able to know where the flights are at all times uh, actually improves the rate at which planes arrive and depart on time. So SWIM data becomes real, interest, real interesting and is very widespread. The SWIM um, data feeds can be accessed. You can go off and sign up for them. You can get the data access anywhere you want to. Um, this is ground control. These are the planes that are moving around on the ground. And unfortunately for me, every time I have tried to do this talk in the last six months, the FAA has managed to turn off my data feed every single freaking time. For this. But nonetheless, you can go off and play with this. Um, there's a little pointer on the slide. So it comes back up. You'll be able to go take a look at it and see what it looks like yourself. So what's the real problem? When I started looking at IoT inside this environment, I had two sets of problems that I'm going on here. I have a, a device problem at the end, and I have a cloud problem at the top. And I needed to cross the, the streams between those two. And in my case, I made it a lot simpler. All my sensors are identical, so I didn't have to worry about a lot of things. It's a very simple data set that I'm passing in a triplet form, which is pretty much what sensor are you, what time is it, what's the data. It's pretty much what happens inside of a sensor environment. You get three things that happens. Those things talk up. I can record the data. I can add more sensors to it which is what drove me crazy in the first place, was adding more sensors to it. I then can expand to store the data. I then could, if I was in an industrial IoT environment or in a really sensitive environment, add firewalls, add load balancers inside of here, and then I want to do something with the data. So I've got to start analyzing the data, so it's got to communicate back and forth between these tracks. And then somebody can come along and say, change out the sensors. And that's already been brought up as well. This is a Texas Instruments sensor tag. And I'm going to make the strong recommendation because occasionally I get asked the question, if you want to start playing with anything in IoT, get yourself a sensor tag. Very clean API set, very simple to work with, and has um, somewhere between 14 and 16 sensors built into it. And dirt cheap. And by the way, so far the battery in this one has lasted slightly over two years. So I'm not, I'm not too unhappy with the, the sensor tag model. Sensor tag model will tell me things like movement. So um, if I brought up the dashboard, you'd be able to see the shake. You can tell when it's light or dark inside of here. You can tell acceleration, you can tell humidity, you can tell temperature. And so this is something that people are now saying, can we attach one of these to go along with this so we know all of the environmental details at the same time that we're knowing all of the, the capabilities inside of that? The short answer is, yeah, right, as soon as I retire and have lots of time to play with this, but secondary issue. So in an IoT environment, fortunately not in mine, sooner or later you're going to want to talk back to the devices, the sensors. And <clears throat> excuse me, continuing forward, there are lots of other sensors. Right now I'm trying to bring in three different sets of sensor data the weather data, the road data, as well as the particulate data. 
Um, I could be bringing in another 14, uh, hopefully not anytime soon, but you're gonna be talking to them in the same way. You gotta worry about security in this environment. My environment, not so much. Um, if somebody goes in and spoofs my sensors, I really don't care. But why security is important. Um, last October, um, you may have remembered, uh, or is it November, there was a little thing called the DIN DNS um, shutdown. There was a denial of service attack against the major um, DNS server for the US East Coast. And everything basically stopped. Netflix stopped, Amazon stopped, lots of things stopped inside of here. That attack was generated by a number of video cameras, IoT video cameras reporting data. So security matters inside of here. My other one is a much more famous favorite example is that um, the, one of the universities in Paris demonstrated a successful hack on um, the Philips Hue light bulbs. And what they did was they flew a, a drone past the building and the flight light bulb started blinking SOS. The nice thing about this from a viewpoint is that the light bulbs could then infect each other. And in a city the size of Paris, the estimate is that 15,000 light bulbs will become a self-sustaining infection and that the entire city of Paris would be infected within 24 hours if there had been 15,000 light bulbs. It gave you an impact of what's going on in there. Fortunately, most of that has been closed off, but that just means that somebody will think about something new inside of here. So think about security. On scale, when you're thinking about security, for instance, with MQTT, you want to make use of something that actually does authentication checking against to make sure that the device you're talking to is the device you think you're talking to. You also want to be able to do not just publication subscription, one of the standards message exchange patterns, that reports data or sends data out, but you also want to do request reply back to the device so that you can say, hey, I've got an update for you. Can you tell me, can you take it now? Or even just simply ask them what version of a system it's running. We find that particularly in consumer electronics, nobody ever bothers to update their bloody video cameras that are just ringing their houses. You know, nobody bothers to update their, their, their um, Nest thermostats. If it doesn't happen automatically, it doesn't happen. However, be fair, the video camera meltdown was because 80% of the people had never bothered to change their password and they were all default passwords. The biggest headache inside of security is always going to be people, guaranteed, 100%. So if we can ever get people out of the loop in, this, in the Internet of Things, we'll probably be pretty secure. So giving that to a little larger example here, this is the Singapore Land Transit Authority's model for traffic tracking. Inside of, of Singapore, if you're going to drive a car in Singapore, your Singapore car will have this thing called an OBU which stands for onboard unit. That's pretty straightforward. And it reports MQTT. And so MQTT data goes up, goes into a collection aspect, then goes into a, a secondary pass out aspect, and then comes out at the other end, for instance, as JMS. And the devices actually are smart enough. And one of the reasons I love them is that they can actually change me from MQTT to JMS and I don't have to write any code to do that. I don't have to worry about it. It'll just change the, the protocol format for me automatically. Number one complaint I've always heard when showing this, maybe not so much over in Europe, but in the US is go, I'm not gonna spend to have an onboard unit put inside my car. Well, the average Ford Mustang inside of Singapore costs $200,000 US. They don't want you driving in Singapore. So cars are really expensive. Adding a $25 OBU doesn't matter to these guys. However, because this thing is constantly in communication and constantly knowing what's going on and rolling data up here, if you park someplace for six minutes, you get charged for six minutes of parking. If you park for two days, you'll get charged for two days. If you park illegally, you will get a ticket, guaranteed. All those different cases. In Singapore, even though they try to control traffic, it's unbelievably busy. And so you'll be going through the Central Expressway and it will just be backed up and they charge you like three Singapore dollars for every kilometer. I, it's, I'm probably making the number, I probably got the numbers reversed or something here, but nonetheless, it's pretty expensive. This capability, because it knows where your car is, what your car is, can come back to you and say, hey, if you'll swing over to the southwest 
freeway instead of the central freeway, you'll get there faster and give you a time estimate, and I'll reduce your cost from three to one dollars for every kilometer you run. And so it becomes a social mechanism that then transports back. Now this is done because of the fact that the thing is in constant communication. These are always on environments. Even if you go through a tunnel and it disconnects, it reconnects. The protocol has to be capable of sustaining disconnection in an IoT environment. MQTT is an always on protocol, but being able to cache those environments means that you get back whenever you come back into connection. And that becomes really unique. Um, the, the person, the architect who built that, this talks about, for instance, he lives a little bit out of town. So his first 10 kilometers of driving, and he usually does it at four in the morning. There's not a lot of cars, and so he tends to slightly exceed the speed limit. I think that's the way he phrases it. Uh, by slightly exceed the speed limit is something like he does about two and a half times the speed limit for that section. I think it's a 30 kilometer or 35 kilometer section, and he does like 85. Uh, inside this. And once a month he gets a letter from the police department saying, we know you're doing this. If you don't cut it out, we're going to, going to do something to you. Now, they don't have a law that lets them do that, but they could certainly say, we know you're going to do this at 4.33 every morning, and we're going to have a car sitting there waiting for you. So there are good sides and bad sides inside of here. But this is fairly simple. Now, I wanted to talk about IoT protocols, mainly because, whoops, wrong one mainly because there are a lot of them. MQTT, we've just talked about, message queuing, tele telemetry tracking, became out of the IBM MQ environments. MQTT SN for sensor network is a version that actually allows disconnected and reconnected sensors environments. CoAP, constrained application protocol, and you can go down the list, DDS, AMQP, uh, advanced message and queuing protocol, it actually turns out to be very popular for IoT over here in Europe. Um, it's about 11% usage. And that sort of leads me to the next thing, um, which is, okay, so I got a lot of these, but you really only have to worry about two or three. HTTP and the REST protocol is still the number one leader uh, for, whoops. Okay, back, yes, HTTP and REST protocols are still the number one leader for protocols in IoT space, EMQTT and CoAP are the next two that follow. Um, this is data from the Eclipse Foundation. Um, I put two years on there, so you can see that um, EMQTT and CoAP are the fastest growers in, MQ, in IoT protocols. Um, however, anybody who comes back and says, none, um, uh, please don't talk to me, because if you're not using a protocol for IoT traffic, you got more problems to worry about than I'm gonna solve. So, HTTP and MQTT, first two. CoAP, special case. So, a little bit of consideration, I've covered some of this. You have to worry about connections, subscriptions, and queues. That's how these devices talk to the back ends. You have to worry about the message exchange patterns inside of here. Device initiated pub sub, sensor talking to the back end, and request reply, cloud initiated request reply is the other one that you have to worry about. Keep in mind with Cloud Foundry, Pivotal Cloud Foundry and so forth, these are not as easy as they look. Thankfully, there was this uh, thing called TCP routing or TCP routes, which um, GE Predix, I first think they first talked about it in Cloud Foundry in 2015, uh, which allows me to natively handle MQTT into this environment. So I mentioned that, I, that there was a workaround for MQTT going into Cloud Foundry. I didn't have to go HTTP. That's how. TCP routes, I think it's TPC routes, are the way that you can manage to pull this off. Very slick piece of code. Um, the headache there is making sure that it scales appropriately to your environment. Oop, come on. So let's talk a little bit of quality of service and very quickly um, for this. QoS zero is I'm gonna send it. If it gets there, good. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. QoS one, I'm gonna send it and I'm gonna make sure that it gets there. But you can duplicate the result. And this is where time stamping can be your best friend inside of a sensor environment. You can easily identify duplicate environments here. And then QoS two, which is once in, exactly once, each of these require more traffic. So when you're looking at this from a bandwidth viewpoint, um, it becomes very important to realize that your bandwidth goes up as you, the amount of traffic goes up. Um, 
There is a stateless challenge if you're doing multiple tiers like this. When the device at the bottom tries to talk to its back end piece, it's load balanced into an environment because that's not a single computer in the middle here for that. And then it then talks to another computer which talks into its application space. If that connection goes away, there is no guarantee that the load balancer will restore it to the correct point, the point that it last was. And so riding through a QoS2 environment within a multiple environment firewalled in space is non-trivial. It can be done, but it is non-trivial. Uh, when you go into a cloud environment where you then are crossing additional boundaries for networking, it's even less non-trivial or more non-trivial. Um, whichever way that works. Protocols, I'm going to scream through this section because um, I can talk about this for about four hours, but nonetheless. Um, AMQP, great, brand new, fully standardized. Um, it supports TCP, UDP, high processing power. You usually see this in the back end environment, but I am beginning to see it show up in, in IoT environments. Um, particularly, again, here in Europe, about 11% of the marketplace is using AMQP as a sensor level environment to talk to the back end here. It is bandwidth intensive. Header fields are big for that. JMS, everybody used JMS. JMS owns the data center, very honestly, inside of here. It's dependent on devices, and there's no interoperability between stacks. So while JMS defined a wire connection, it did not define an API environment. And so there is no guarantee that if you change JMS providers that you will be able to, to adapt your code without change inside of here. Um, all classes of service, but there's no interoperability becomes a bit of a headache inside of here. Uh, REST, of course, everybody knows REST. REST lives everywhere, don't worry about it. No QoS, you're on your own. No message exchange patterns, you're on your own. And REST is a blocking protocol. So no REST will respond. REST is going to wait until it gets a response. And so in an IoT environment where you are passing messages around to say break because there's somebody inside of the, uh, the crosswalk, um, it may not be your best idea. So you may, do, may need to be able to say, I didn't get a response, slam the brakes on anyway. Reliability is application dependent, so if it doesn't work, you're on your own. MQTT, personal bias, I like MQTT. It's simple, it's lightweight, it's low power, but it doesn't support header fields. So I don't know what's in the message until I open the message, unlike all those others. And so that, means, that adds another layer of complexity so that I can no longer do really good routing I have to open the packet to see what's in the packet before I can take the packet to the right place. I can do header routing, but I can't do content routing. And MQTT would be kind of nice to have those things. It also doesn't directly support queuing capabilities, and so there's some headaches inside of that. It does have an SKN version. And then constrained application protocol, if you remember the list, HTTP, MQTT, COAP. COAP is a rep request reply model. PubSub is coming. It's been coming for about a couple of years now here. This runs below TCP. It runs on the UDP level. And so if you're going to cross bridges and go beyond that 127 devices, you're on your own. There are some great bridging tools. And if you want more information, I'm running out of time. Um, stop by my booth upstairs. And I'll, I'll discuss those with you. So quick summary so I can have two minutes of questions here. Um, IoT has been an interesting light. Writing IoT without dealing with the cloud is fairly straightforward problem. It is still a scale problem. Adding the cloud into this IoT space and not using any of the current IoT platforms that exist in public clouds, as, a, as an observation, I haven't tried this yet, is non-trivial. And it's all about how the data communicates and how the data moves in and out inside of here. So the one thing I can say is, if you can, stay with the standard wire protocols. Uh, do not get trapped into a proprietary uh, structure for your data inside of here, and be as flexible as possible in movement. And with that, uh, that information is me. You can find me on, on let's see, Twitter, Facebook, or Skype on those, um, on LinkedIn, or GitHub, I'm DW McAllister. On LinkedIn, I'm Dave Mack uh, here. Emails here. If you want to play with this yourself, there are two things. The um, VMR that I mentioned here is free, complete usage. You can go find it on our, our devs portal. And source code is available in GitHub for that. 
And while y'all are reading, this is my favorite connected car, um, autonomous car, car team of all times. Uh, if I ever own, if I'm ever rich enough to own, you know, like a Tesla, I'm never going to leave it running inside of that. With that, questions? Shock? <laughs> If not, yes. I have. So the question is, why didn't I use MQTT over WebSockets? And I could, but the, the headache becomes when you start trying to look at that as a scale problem. So if you're setting up 10,000 WebSockets, at the same time you're setting up 10,000 separate MQTT queues, it becomes a challenging problem to be able to manage both of those environments separately. I now need to be able to, to relate every single queue to every single time. Think of it in a sense that I'm gonna be setting up a virtual environment for every single connection point. Whereas MQT already has that capability built into it to recognize each device by its message header fields. And so it simplifies the problems to simply use MQTT as a native basis. Um, so yes, that would work in my, my Emerald Park example, but it would not work for a connected car company who's trying to run eight million cars. If not, I will be in our booth if you've got questions or just wanna tell me what you're doing in IoT because I love to hear stories inside of that. Thanks for your time and attention and enjoy the rest of the show.